Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you. Wow. Oh, my God. Yeah. So yeah. to speak. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, are we worthy? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not quite sure how to describe this uh, place we're in right now. <laughs> it's, a, it's astonishing. I was it's, explaining um, to Gloria before we, uh, before we started that... Um, I've been on an uh, endless uh, book tour. I am truly the Willie Loman of American letters. <laughs> I go from one place to another with my little satchel of books. And the only place as grand as this that I have been is the Bob Dylan Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma, <laughs> Gloria's hometown. Oh, that's great. Oh, well, thank you all for coming. This is amazing. Um, I am so happy to be back with Adam. Last time we were on a screen during COVID, so it was really great to see him in person today. And I have to just say, I love this book. I love the feeling of it. I just love it. The only um, thing I would say is that I wish there were illustrations. You know, <laughs> you're a visual person. I, I kind of needed illustrations for all of these different masteries you took on. But what? Just to get started, though, it's dedicated to Kirk Barnado, and I just wanted Adam to say something about this and how it relates to the book. Oh, th um, thank you, Gloria. I'm, 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 I'm glad to be that you asked that. So, Gloria and I should ex explain are celebrating our fourth decade of friendship. We mm -hmm. met in 1985 at an uh, art institute symposium on the Grand Jatte mm -hmm. when I was a young pup art historian, and she was a, a young pup curator, <laughs> and we pupped together um, in doing this. But my the reason I was a young pop art historian and not yet full a full-time writer, which is what I should have been, was because of Kirk Varnado. Kirk, Kirk was, um, uh, to my mind, the, one of the great art historians of his generation and without question the greatest teacher I've ever known or experienced. I, uh, he was my professor in graduate school. We went on to curate a show together at the Museum of Modern Art, which traveled to Chicago, called High and Low, Modern Art and Popular Culture, a show which was notorious in its day and nostalgic in its aftermath. This tends to happen to highly controversial things. People uh, uh, now remember it fondly who hated it when it opened. Uh, Kirk was the greatest teacher I've ever known. I, I wrote a long essay about him in an earlier book of mine called Through the Children's Gate because in a way that recalls Hemingway's uh, uh, beautiful lines in it's still, I still get verklempt about it. I, in Farewell to Arms, about how the world punishes those who are too gifted and, and beautiful. Um, Kirk died very young of cancer. And, um, but before he did, in the last year of his life, he gave a brilliant set of lectures on the history of abstract art at the, um, at the National Gallery in Washington. And simultaneously, though he knew it was he, that he did not have long to live, he coached my son Luke's eight-year-old football team called oh, the Giant Metrozoids oh. to victory. And in the story, which is called Last of the Metrozoids, is about the intertwining of Kirk teaching uh, uh, the, the most abstruse and difficult of subjects, history of abstract art, while coaching these eight-year-old boys in how you play football correctly. So it was a study in teaching and what was so impressive was that the two activities were completely continuous and entangled. Everything that, that he did as a, as a most inspired lecturer I had ever heard, ever will hear in our history, and everything he did as a, as a football coach were overlapped, basically meaning that, and this is thematic in this book, and it's why I dedicated it to Kirk, because he taught me this. It was always all about breaking it down into its smallest parts, whatever the task you had. Mm -hmm. If you were going to play football, the crucial thing you spent two hours doing was learning how to get in a three-point stance. You didn't run a play, you didn't do anything else, you just learned the right way of getting in a three-point stance. And if you were going to study abstract art, what you did is you did not worry about the vast abstract and metaphysical generalizations about God knows what, the loss of the picture plane or the acquisition of the picture plane and commodity culture. You talked about what exactly Mondrian had been doing step by step, mm -hmm. day by day, week by week uh, in his ascent and then did the same with Frank Stella. And that habit of breaking everything down and then building it back up from the smallest parts into the larger practices 
that could be cultural, artistic, or recreational in football was what he believed in profoundly. And um, to such a degree, and I'm answering this question, I know at greater length, but I can't resist this anecdote. We used to have a joke together, because I'm a crazy football fan too, and uh, we are, both of us have wives who are not football fans. And we missed the greatest college game of all time, Boston College, Miami, 1983, um, because we were off <laughs> at a Shaker Fair um, with our spouses. And it was a standing joke between us about something you wanted to do but you couldn't do because your, your wife wanted to do something else. We would just say Boston College, Miami. And the last weekend of his life, we finally got to watch on tape Boston College versus Miami and Kirk analyzed the famous winning pass that Doug Flutie threw with such acuity and brilliance and broke it down into its, into its fundamental features. And, it, and then uh, uh, it passed away. Um, wow. As you can see, it's wow. a subject of deep emotion for me, yeah. so we should move on to okay. something, we'll move something on. else. I but just to say, what great teachers give us, right? Yeah are two things, and I, to, to generalize, and it's the truth, because this book is very much about my falling in love with a series of teachers, because I love great teachers, and great teachers are irascible people, male and female. They're just difficult people, but the thing that they all have in common in my experience, and every one of the teachers who I studied drawing and boxing and dancing and driving with in, in the course of assembling this book, um, all have in common is they set an incredibly high standard and don't compromise on the standard. But if you're prepared to pursue that standard with passion and perseverance, they have infinite patience for you. They'll, they'll stick with you as you stumble in the belief that you can eventually dance. And that is what I think all great teachers have in common, and Kirk exemplified that. Well, wow, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things um, I just loved about, there's so many, I mean, it's, you said it wasn't a self-help book, but. It really is, because there's so much you can take away from it, and it's just like constant um, witty but profound things that I was kept underlining, which is, you know, really not a good way to read a book, but I'm making all these little remarks. But I was thinking about, it's the most, to me, and I've sort of followed your career, it's the most personal. Even Paris to the Moon, which was very personal about your five years, and you had, a, you had Olivia there. But when I thought about that, those challenges were imposed on you. I mean, you were there. Did you speak French before you went? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> okay. Well, somehow you managed to deal, in, you know, with yeah. the French and um, the Parisian French. And it was, but those were like imposed. Every day was a challenge. Everything you had to do just to survive was kind of like there. But this is a book about things that you chose to challenge yourself with. And I just... And I was trying to think of the, the difference between a George Plimpton who would do, you know, he's going to do the football, he's going to do the mm -hmm. timpani, he's going to do all that, these participatory journalistic things. But your book, it's more personal because everything you chose was for personal reasons. It's a connection to your family and your dearest friends. Yes, this is, this is true. You know, it's funny you mentioned Plimpton and you're the only person who has, because obviously that was in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. Plimpton, by the way, I don't know if people still remember George Plimpton, but he was the editor of the Paris Review, and he wrote a wonderful book called Paper Lion about uh, spending a summer in training camp with the Detroit Lions as a quarterback and so on. And um, Plimpton was a wonderful writer, and I reference him on page five of the book. I know you did. Just to wave yeah. at his ghost, yeah. you know, yeah. coming, coming, yeah. coming around. But you're absolutely right. It's a totally different kind of enterprise. Yeah. Um, I, first of all, I didn't have the idea of doing a book about learning to do things. I started learning to do things and I realized it could become a book. So that the, the, the two crucial, the first two chapters, the chapter called The Real Work About Magic, happened because my son, Luke, fell in love with um, card magic and got sort of precocious at it, had a fantastic, irascible teacher named Jamie Ian Swiss, and Jamie said to him, he was 13 at the time, hey kid, you gotta go out to Las Vegas if you're ever gonna really learn magic. And his school in New York said, no, you don't have to go out to Las Vegas. And I said, you know what, let's go to Las Vegas. And if you have never followed your 13-year-old son to Las Vegas <laughs> in order to dine with magicians, you haven't lived. 
And <laughs> that happened, right? And I got fascinated by the, the craft of magicians because magicians, for me, are a model art form because unlike the painters and artists we work with and love, um, nobody takes them quite seriously, right? There's no, no one's gonna write them up uh, in the art world, in the New Yorker, there's no the magic world. So, and yet they have this incredibly high standard of craft. So I got fascinated by them. And then I, I had to learn, I decided on an impulse to learn how to draw. Now, have you ever studied drawing? Did you ever do? No, I was cringing <laughs> reading that chapter because I have spent decades talking about art and I cannot draw. Right. And it well, was, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's an endemic, uh, uh, what, what do they, the French call it? Deformation professionnelle, a professional right. deformation. <laughs> of art critics and art historians. And let me add right away, my little brother, who's an art critic of note mm -hmm. and an art biography, wrote a great biography of Andy Warhol, was very offended by the whole thing. Because his feeling is, is of course you don't have to draw well to talk well about art. Um, and that's true in the same way you can be a great sports writer without being able to hit a fastball uh, or throw a punch. But I still persist in thinking, and at least this was my experience, that you don't have to be able to hit a 100 mile per hour fastball to be a sports writer, but if you've never stood there when a 100 mile per hour fastball comes by, at some deep level you don't understand the level <laughs> of skill and accomplishment that's necessary to play baseball. And I feel that having spent two years studying life drawing and never getting any, you know, never advancing in any significant way, but getting a little bit better over those two years, studying with another irascible teacher, a wonderful representational painter named Jacob Collins, who thinks that all art, to our shame, Gloria, took a fundamentally wrong turn in 1855. And that, so pre-Bouguereau? Pre-Bouguereau, pre-Bouguereau. Just, it's, it's all, <laughs> you know, it's Ancre and his students were the last real painters. And everybody since has been going down. All the people we love, Sokhov, Van Gogh, are just incompetent, so ham-handed color, words. in other words, yes, color, color is anything. out. Only classical drawing counts. And he managed to create a world for himself in New York where when you walk into his atelier, you might as well be in Paris in 1854 because it's nothing but plaster casts and nude models wow. and natural light, and that's what you learn. And I, you know, I don't share his taste, but I respect the intensity of his conviction and of his commitment to a, a, a particular dream, which, parenthetically, is sort of avant-garde because nobody else is doing it. Um, but what I learned, and, and this is the one thing I took away from it, is, is that art is made up of its minutiae. It's made up of, of that thousand, just you know, when I was talking about Kirk and breaking things down into steps, football begins with a three-point stance, and Art begins with deciding that the, the, the weight of your figure falls on the left rather than on the right. And when, once you know how hard that is to register, you never look past it again. You, you know, the, and you never, again, make the leap to the metaphysical generalization too quickly, you know, which we're inclined to do, and nobody more guilty of that than me. Um, we're inclined to treat art as though artists are a series of pawns in a game of historical chess that we are playing against each other. And that's uh, truly a deformation professionnelle of, of art historians. I, I was fascinated by that chapter because, and I almost wanted to bring a sketch pad <laughs> so you could demonstrate how you were taught to, but the idea that you're not taught to draw what you see, like those, um, those projection things we used to get on the back of comics where yes, you, yes, you, know, yes. you do that, and that instead you had to think about a nation or a, or a, you know, it was or just faith. such a well, you know, strange when, technique. Out on the road, I would, when I had a crowd, um, and thank you, a little smaller than this one, I would begin by passing out drawing paper to everybody in the audience. I mean, when I say the audience, often it was five or ten people. Um, that's, that's life on the road. But, and say to them, draw, a, uh, just draw the face of the person you're sitting next to. Because inevitably, everybody draws a kind of schematic version mm -hmm. of the face of the person sitting next to. And what Jacob taught me was, you gotta break your symbol set, as he called it. In other words, the conventional stereotypes with which we see the world, so that we see, you know, we make eyes in circles and noses as triangles and, and 
and Mal's bananas and so on. And he'd say, the way you break your symbol set isn't by observing, because that's too, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. He said, it's you have to form a new symbol set. He said, so look at someone's face and superimpose a watch face over it. And then just ask yourself, is his eyebrow, is the person you're talking, is his eyebrow at 10 minutes past one or 12 minutes past one? Or, or is the, the formation of his forehead at three minutes before midnight or two minutes before midnight? And I spent weeks just making, he had a beautiful term for this, tilts in time. And he would say to me, just like the three-point stance, he said, just make tilts in time. And I would make tilts in time. And you become, your eye then becomes um, newly acclimatized to the, exactly the minutiae of, of, of observation. And you start making faces instead of making faces, you right. know, and you start drawing faces instead of making faces. And it was, it was a series of very counterintuitive little subroutines that Jacob had me learn exactly to break all the schematic information I have, we all have in our heads, me particularly perhaps, uh, about it. And it was fascinating. And the great thing, Gloria, is that even someone as utterly ungifted as I am gets better. I mean, you never get good, but you get better. And that, that's another thing that struck me is that there's a point when you were satisfied that you said, I mean, I don't think you, you did two years, but you didn't go on. You, right. you did the boxing with Joey, Yes. but you didn't want to be with an opponent. You didn't <laughs> want to. And talk about that a little bit. Well, boxing, of all the things that, that I, and, and as I said, it wasn't a conceptual, uh, you know, conceptual idea, or I'll learn all these things. Just one thing after another, as happens to us in life, and particularly, I think, in, shall we call it midlife, um, there, are, uh, there are things that you want to do. One of the things I wanted to do was to, it, it was also the pandemic impelled this a bit because you couldn't go to a gym, right? Because the gyms were all closed in New York, believe it or not. And uh, so I ended up taking boxing lessons with another amazing teacher, Joey Contrada. And if that's not a name from Central Casting, right? You say, what's the boxing teacher going to be called? Joey, let's call him Joe, Joey Contrada. He said, eh, it's a little too on the nose, right? But that's what my boxing teacher is named. And he's a great Muay Thai champion, what we ignorant ones call kickboxing. And Joey is a great teacher. And in the same way, right, what, what um, I learned from Joey is that boxing, you don't learn to box by unleashing your belligerence, right? You start, you know, throwing punches. You learn a very tightly choreographed sequence of blows, jab, jab, cross, slip, uppercut, right? This typical one. And you have to just continually repeat them until it begins to seep into your insides. So you're no longer remembering it, you're just doing it as a seemingly seamless sequence. And, th and which is what you do, you persevere until that begins to happen. Um, and the other thing, which is fascinating, is that the only way you can learn to box, as I'm sure anyone knows who's done it, is by imagining your opponent. There is no opponent, right? And, but you have to constantly be thinking that every punch you throw is in anticipation of the punch he might throw, right? Otherwise, there's no structure to the art of boxing. Um, there's no meaning to it, exactly, because you're, not, because you're not responding to anything. Now, I have never actually gotten in the ring with anyone. If you can find another five foot five um, Jewish intellectual in his mid-60s, who has a, a lot of belligerence to unleash, <laughs> preferably someone on the far right wing, so I would have motivation. <laughs> I will step in the ring in a, and we can fight a, a benefit. But until that moment arrives, it's all, you know, I'm doing it in, in, in a gym, but it's the most intellectually invigorating thing I've ever done because it, it exemplifies that process of breaking things down into their smaller parts and then building them back up not, not building them back up. They become on their own. They become on their own a sequence because of the nature of, of, of our psychology, which is very good at implanting things until we get to do it. I mean, dancing is the, is, the, is the ultimate and the obvious statement of that. You stumble and then you mm -hmm. step and mm -hmm. then you find your dancing. And the dancing as, as you know, I, was, I did, again, not in order to learn to dance, though I was wanted to, because my daughter Olivia, who, as you say correctly, was the big event, the All of Paris to the Moon, that book is about moving mm. towards Olivia, my baby being born, our baby, being
being born in Paris. And um, Olivia now is in her early 20s. She went off to university. And she, as I like to say, she came into herself rather than coming out to her parents. She discovered in university that she was queer, which is the word she prefers to gay, and delightfully so with a fantastic girlfriend. And we were not at all uh, troubled, much less shocked by it. But it was marked a, a new moment in our relationship. We'd always been extremely close. We're very similar in temperament and, and tension, body tension. And I said to her when, when she was talking to me about it, instead of saying, darling, let's talk about, you know, intimate details of our life and yours. I said, baby, would you like to learn to do um, ballroom dancing together? And to my surprise and delight, she said, yes, Dad, I would love that. And we both knew it was a way of having an intimate conversation that wasn't verbal. And we're both very verbal people, and this gave us a chance to have intimacy without discourse of that mm -hmm. kind. And we started taking... Uh, dance lessons exactly again at the height of the pandemic so we couldn't go in a dance studio and we would dance on the Esplanade in Central Park together. We had another wonderful teacher, Steve Dane, um, whose name we didn't know until afterwards because when he first, we first got introduced, we thought it was Steve Dance, which made a lot of sense. So we always like, called him like Steve Joey Dance. Contrast. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Central casting. And we learned the foxtrot and the waltz, and we would go out there on Central Park, and, and Steve would play, you know, old Sinatra records. Fly me to the moon. Of course. And, you'd, and, and Olivia and I would dance, and it was the most intimate conversation we ever had. And what was fascinating too, Gloria, is it was very much, though nonverbal, it was about the material of her identity, because she would tease me. She'd say, Dad, this is the most gendered activity we've ever done. <laughs> because the man leads and the woman follows in, in ballroom dancing. And I said to her, I would whisper to her, do you want to do it the other way around? Because Steve, a good classical teacher, would say, Adam, now you step forward with your left foot. And I'd say, babe, do you want to do it the other way around? And she'd say, no, no. And I knew what she was saying was, here in Central Park on the Esplanade, listening to Sinatra, we can make a little parenthesis in time where we're living in a, in a previous thing. I don't, we don't need to subvert the foxtrot. The foxtrot is sufficiently subverted in, <laughs> in the world. And it became a very uh, uh, intimate uh, conversation the two of us had. And that's the other theme of the book, is exactly that in everything we do involves everything we are, right? Mm -hmm. We can't do, it, it's, what we, it's why we love art, I yeah. think, Glory. It's because there's, you can't make a gesture on canvas, and a real artist can't, that doesn't evoke the entirety of the social world mm -hmm. that, that she's in, or the entirety of the psychological state. You know, I think of sometimes of Elizabeth Murray, you know, the wonderful mm -hmm. American painter, who is, again, has left us sadly too soon. But, you know, it was always fascinating to talk to her, because she would do these wonderful pictures of, of um, kind of big cartoon feet and shoes. And I asked her once about them and I said, you know, why do you love that icon? She said, oh, those are my father's feet. Those are my father's shoes. Aww. He was, he was a, an insurance salesman and I, he would come home at night and there'd be a big hole in his foot because he'd be pounding the pavement. And nobody had ever made that association. We talked about her love of cartoon, her mastery of shape, but everything we do involves everything we are. And that's, mm -hmm. another, that's another lesson I hope of the book. Wow. Well, I, I have so many questions. <laughs> so one question, because Adam was an amazing art critic, as you know, for The New Yorker, amazing. Because you knew artists, you knew living artists, but you also knew art history. And to me, you mastered that, you, you nailed it. And yet, you moved on. Yeah. And why was that? Oh, it's a great question. Um, uh, for that very, partly for that very reason, I mean, I hardly think I'd mastered it. You were like the Jane, spin. no, you were the John Russell. Right. You could have, you were the John Russell. Um, I, I did feel, I'll, I will give you a very straight answer to that, which I don't think I've ever said in public. Um, I was going to see, shortly after my son Luke was born, 1994, and I was the art critic of the, Mag of the New Yorker, which was a wonderful job that I was blessedly lucky to have, and, and, and when we're young, we don't, understand our blessings adequately of, of such things. Um, and I was going to a Bruce Nauman show of his clown torture videos. And I'm a big Nauman fan. I'd written about Nauman. I could explicate it. I could explain it. I could, I, I could articulate it. He's an immensely serious and significant artist and all that. But as I was going through it, I thought to myself, I love this stuff, 
but I don't love it exclusively. I'm fascinated by how kids grow up. I'm fascinated by childhood, by France, by a million other things, and I'm not writing adequately about the things that I love. And finally, when you don't write as, if you're a real writer, as I hope I am, if you're not writing about the things... I think we can say <laughs> No, I, I mean, you know, if you're, you know, the difference being that journalists write from the outside in and writers write from the inside out. And if you're not writing adequately from your true insides, if you're mm -hmm. faking your insides, it will become apparent to your readers that, you, that, that it's an abstract, again, activity. And I said at that moment, said, I'm going to stop doing this. Not because I didn't love it, but because I loved other things equally, if not more, and I wanted to be writing about my actual in, inner life, not about my, um, my a secondary inner life. So I walked back to the office, and I said to Tina Brown, who was then the editor, you know, I think I'd like to go somewhere and write from abroad. And bless her, she said, well, London, of course. And I said, no, actually, I was thinking Paris. She said, Paris, all right. And, she, and that basically, wow. we, we, and, we, and we turned it around. And I, I've, it was, I miss it sometimes because, <laughs> as you know better than I do, there are certain moments when you're with works of art that give you a charge so powerful that it is almost unbearable, right? That you can't, uh, we were just talking before, I went to San Remy, the asylum where Van Gogh was sent after his Terry Christmas episode in 1888 and painted his, I think, his greatest pictures just this past fall and I was literally overwhelmed with emotion at being in that space and thinking about him and I wanted to write something about it. Um, and I will tell you that after f how many years away, I signed a contract in 1990 to write a book on American art, a new history of American oh. art. And I am now going to do it. I'm now going to, to put it oh, together. Good. And with, especially, and with, the, the, and with help from the Art Institute too, because the Art Institute very generously has put their whole um, collection, right, is on, mm -hmm. is what, what's the word, open source, or, right. Right, right. which is fantastic. Common, something common, right. yeah, so it's no something longer. Anyway, yeah. th that's yeah. a very long-winded answer to your question, no, but that's, no, that's, that's, the, that's the reason. So um, uh, there are moments when I regret it only in as much as there's either a wonderful show that you want to praise or a terrible show <laughs> that you want to assault. And you know, the other thing I'd add is that I knew one great art critic intimately, Bob Hughes, Robert Hughes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I never felt that Bob was sufficiently fulfilled by being an art critic. He was a man of immense encyclopedic appetites. And he wrote about those later. He wrote good books oh, about boy, cities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in a funny way, he had become professionalized as an art critic in a way that constrained the totality of mm -hmm. his gift as a writer. And I never wanted to be in that Interesting. position. Interesting. And that brings me to something else, because as I was thinking about these different challenges, and how you write so beautifully about how life is, um, you know, you go through school and our DNA is to avoid, we try to escape what we aren't good at, what we think yeah. we won't be good at, because we want to excel, because that's the way we're programmed. But I was also thinking about the idea of a recital, because I think that's what ruins things when you have to actually, a culmination, your learning was for yourself. You, you were satisfied at this level, you, you, you'd been with the masters, you knew what right. it took. And I wonder if that's something, how do you feel about that? Because it seems like unless you have that final performance, that recital, whatever, you didn't study it. Yeah, well, you know, in the book, I make a distinction <coughs> between, um, oh, and I should tell quickly just that when I, I thought when I gave up art, criticism is a full-time thing. I thought Kirk Varnado, we were talking about, would be upset because his whole life was devoted to it and I'd been very much his, his student as, in doing it. So After I went, rugby. Yes, exactly. And I went to tell him, I said, hey, I'm, I've decided I'm going to um, uh, stop writing art criticism and, and go to France. And he said, oh, thank God. And I thought, <laughs> huh? <laughs> um, but he meant it in the most generous way. He meant, right. I'm glad you're, you've thrown your cap over the wall and you're, you're following your heart. Um, the, the truth is, I make a distinction in the book, right, between achievement and accomplishment, which I know can seem a little subtle to people, but it's exactly that's what I'm talking about. There's some things in life, and we drive our kids in this society particularly towards achievement, which always involves the test, the recital, getting into the next school, uh, 
uh, flourishing in the next grade, all of those things that have tests at mm -hmm. the end. And those are achievements, and we live in an achievement-oriented society, mm -hmm. and, that's, and we count the achievements by money sometimes, by grades other times, but we are driven by achievement. And there's something empty about it. I mean, we all have to live in a real world of professional, of professional achievement, and we can't deny it. And I am as driven to those things as anyone, and as guilty of that as anyone can be. But when I, my own kids were growing up, the thing that I couldn't help but notice is that what really gave them um, meaning in their lives were the accomplishments they pursued on their own, whether it was learning card tricks or guitar chords or... Uh, uh, sewing, that those, those, those accomplishments gave them a, found, a serene foundation of possibility that no number of scholastic or academic achievements ever could. And the, the more that we encourage our kids and ourselves to pursue those accomplishments, which are self-generated, have a very high standard of craft, but in your sense, no recital at mm -hmm. the end necessarily, the, not only the happier will they be, but the better suited, the better fitted they'll be to find something in the world of achievements that they really want to achieve and get out of the terrible rat maze that we put kids in so often, right? Where the question is, if you keep studying, you can get the little hit of sugar water and then turn to your right and there's another hit of sugar water awaiting you and what, where the center of the maze is, much less the exit, is... Mm -hmm. is is never defined. So I think there's a huge value. And let me add, and you know, this is something that you learn on, on by listening. I'm not doing much of it today, I'm aware. But um, on the road you do, and one of the things that I was struck by, and I hadn't fully internalized when I was writing the book, is that for so many people who are in mid middle age or early middle age or late middle age, you know, we tend to patronize people who are older and pursuing new things, right? Mm -hmm. We say, oh, good for you, you're doing macrame or doing yoga or whatever it is. And that's what this book is about in large part. But the truth is, and this is the good news that I bring, the gospel I bring, is that those things, the, you know, the, the older folks who are doing something new, they've got rocket fuel in their hands. Mm -hmm. That's not trivial or secondary. That's incredibly powerful because the single thing that we as human beings seek is what I like to call the cognitive opiate of the flow. There are a lot of opiates we can put in our veins. There's only one opiate we produce in our brains, and that's that extraordinary feeling of being completely absorbed in something outside ourselves. When you're hanging a show, mm -hmm. right, it's that feeling, right, day after day, and then, you know, you lose, literally lose track of time because it's so absorbing. When I'm in the middle uh, of an essay, but the great thing is, is that if you give yourself over to a new activity and you pursue it with passion and perseverance, even if you never get any good at it by an external standard, you still have access to that cognitive opiate. You still have access to the flow and to that absorption. I have never been happier in my life than I am when boxing badly. And that includes <laughs> writing well. I write well and I box badly, and they both make me about equally happy. In fact, the boxing makes me happier because when we do something well, when we do something as a vocation, we can only be aware of the space between our original ambitions mm -hmm. and our actual accomplishments. Mm -hmm. So that when I'm writing, I'm thinking every sentence is going to have the psychological intricacy of Proust and the sensual rhapsody <laughs> of John Updike and the malicious wit of Jane Austen. And it doesn't. I, don't, <laughs> I never quite get all the sentences that good. Um, and that's all I see. I never take pleasure in my own writing for that reason. I take pleasure in doing it, but not in reading it. Um, but when you're boxing, you can say, boy, I really threw that jab today better mm -hmm. than I've ever thrown it. Or I mm -hmm. opened up my shoulder to throw the cross better than I ever have. It, it would not knock out a mouse <laughs> if the mouse was there. <laughs> but the potential, and, and my favorite chapter in the book actually is, is about that. Because, you know, I pursued that old folk tale that hummingbirds and elephants have the same number of heartbeats in a lifetime that you know you've all heard that right that that and that turns out to be true there's a a research project at north carolina state university called the heartbeat project and they just collate the heartbeats of mammals and birds and it turns out grosso modo that almost all 
mammals and birds have a billion heartbeats in a lifetime. The hummingbird expends her heartbeats in 100 days, the elephant in 100 years. But the, the, the metaphoric leap you have to make from that is that the hummingbird doesn't feel that she has less of existence in her experience than the elephant does. And we can judge ourselves by our interior hummingbird heartbeats as naturally as we are judged in the outer world by the, the, ele the exterior elephants of, of excellence. Um, and so this is a long-winded way of saying that there is a limitless rewards in pursuing new accomplishments in later life that you will always do badly. <laughs> Well, and I love the fact that <laughs> always do badly. Well, that's optimistic. Um, I love the fact that in this world of remote learning and you know, and every can, you can learn by YouTube. You can that you went out and sought people that were really, really good masters of what they do, because you were interested in the learning, but also the relationships. And it sounds like you kept these relationships. Like these are not just I'm through that these are people you're gonna see again. No, we had a party, in fact. I didn't want to have a book party because book parties are inherently sad because everybody's fingers crossed, hopeful the book is gonna do well. So we decided to have a book party after the book was already a failure when we could just <laughs> enjoy it. Um, and, but we brought together all of the teachers from the, oh, nice. from the, from nice. the book and because yeah. they had not known each Including other. Including your mother. Include, well, unfortunately I couldn't bring my mom along. Oh. She's not, she's, oh. She's oh. not as well as, oh. I, as I wish she was. But she was there. But spirit. she was there. Oh, my God. My mother's there every minute of my life, <laughs> um, hovering over my shoulder and telling me, dear, dear, you can do that better. Um, uh, That's where it started. Yeah, no kidding. No <laughs> kidding. You want to excuse us. We maybe need a psychoanalytic session here. But it's true that my, my mother is an extraordinary woman. She was a great cook and a great baker, and none of that was what she did professionally. She was a linguist, scientist. And uh, uh, there's a whole chapter about learn, going up to learn to bake with her, which you know, I never thought, Gloria, but now that I, I stopped to think about it, is very much like the chapter about dancing with my daughter. It was a way of having a conversation with my mother, who's a brilliant uh, but somewhat difficult woman. And we are very much alike. And we were you know, loving, but it could have complicated exchanges. And I thought, well, I'll just go up and bake with her, and we'll just have our hands in the same sourdough starter. Uh, and that turned out to be very worthwhile. And also it was revelatory for me, because um, uh, Martha, my wife, I, I had totally forgotten, was a baker when we first met. She baked her own bread, but I got kind of so lost in my mother's very extravagant and ostentatious <laughs> world of showy baking that her little loaf got... Um, uh, <laughs> I had amnesia she about it. She got outloved. She got outloved. And I had to be reminded that she was not a loaf, but a baker, which is a valuable <laughs> thing for, for a, a husband of many years. Well, I know we're going to have to start. I think we're going to have to start closing out so we can get some questions and answers. But I have, one, I, I have so many questions. We have to continue this. But one of the things I would like to know, you said you took up boxing because of Trump basically, to let out hot. So if things don't go as well as they should in a couple of years, what will you take up? <laughs> Learning Italian, I guess. Oh, those are great words. <laughs> you know, or wh wherever a country will have me. Learning Slovenian or something, probably more likely. But you know, th there's a serious point there, if I can try and make it succinctly. Um, and that is that People have asked me, my last, the book I wrote before this one was called A Thousand Small Sanities, mm -hmm. The Moral Adventure of Liberalism. And it was a letter to Olivia about liberal values, not liberal in the, in the party sense, not Democratic Party, but liberal in the broader sense mm -hmm. that, that includes everyone who's invested in uh, liberal democracy and in, in, in uh, uh, humanistic values. And people have asked me, you know, well, why did you decide not to, you know, this is a very apolitical book, why? Is everything okay now? And I said, no, <laughs> it's not. But because the key concept for me about the liberalism as I understand it, again, about not meaning a particular sectarian uh, school of politics, but a commitment to the values of an open society, the crucial concept is pluralism. That's what makes a liberal society different 
from other societies. We believe in pluralism. We believe in a pluralism that includes religions and, and faiths. This, and This room. This room of it's all like kinds. And we welcome pluralistic. it and we embrace it and we don't make war on it. We accept that yeah. there will be people of fundamentally different beliefs and practices and faiths and values from our own. And we welcome them and we say, let's all coexist as best we can. Let's not go to war on each other. That's what makes a liberal society unique. And there's a pluralism of political opinion, it's vital, but a pluralism of political opinion, which was what my last book was about, is rooted in a pluralism of pleasures, which is mm -hmm. what this book is about. It's rooted in the idea that we don't turn to the state or the church or any other authority to tell us what we should pursue and what we can enjoy. We turn to our neighbors, we turn to our friends, we turn to all what Burke called the little platoons of society. And some of us live for post-impressionist painting, and some <laughs> of us hate post-impressionist painting, like my friend Jacob. And we don't try to anathematize either, mm -hmm. either belief system. We privilege some, and we, and we un underprivilege others, and it's an imperfect system. But I wanted this book to be about the pluralism of pleasures that I hope is the foundation of uh, pluralistic politics. Well, thank you. It's, it is a, such a pleasurable book. If you haven't read it, please get it, because it's just so much to take away, even the little hand wave, which we won't get into that, but I use that today. Yes. Um, so I think we should probably wrap up and ask some questions of Mr. Gopnik. Yes. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, so we have some limited time today since we have many events going on. So please keep your questions brief. Go ahead and stand, state your name, and just ask a question. We'll leave the stories to Gloria and Adam. All right. If I could see a show of hands, we'll start off right over here. Hi, Mark Siegel. So hey, Mark. you talked about baking. Um, I'm more of a cook than a baker, although I've started um, trying to master pizza making at home. Uh. But I'd be interested, I, I've heard you on a lot of food podcasts, and I'd be interested in what you see, if any, as essential differences between baking and cooking, uh, particularly along the, the sort of the lens of mastery that you've worked on, other than you tend to focus on using a scale in baking more than another cooking. Yeah, it's a great question. In simple, in, in plain English, right, um, cooking is um, improvisational and baking can't be, right? And that's hard. So I love cooking, right, because you always, can, you know, you add a little something extra if you're, if you're a little bit off, if you have a, you know, if it calls, the recipe calls for a quarter cup of white wine and you have, you add half a cup or you don't have a quarter cup of white wine and you use uh, vermouth, you can make it, you can play with it. You can't do that with baking. Baking is essentially a chemical transaction and it suits people like the French who are very rigid in their, in their habits, right? And I, um, I'm a natural cook in that way. For me, cooking is the release. And I cook almost every night because I'm locked in my head in the, in the precision of words. And then I come out at night and I can escape into a physical precision of chopping onions, but also into the freedom of doing things. So baking for me is kind of um, antithetical to my nature. But I still try it. And my mom taught me how to make the boissant, which is her own invention. It's a cross between a brioche and a croissant. And this will tell you something. On, in one of these colloquies when I was blessed with an, an interlocutor like Gloria, it was Malcolm Gladwell. And Malcolm said to me, how could you let a million dollars just fall on the floor? You should be opening boissanteries <laughs> all over America where you have mom got next boissons, right? This is the difference between my dear friend Malcolm Gladwell and myself. <laughs> I just want to interject here. We've done a lot of French shading, but both of us love the French, and we're both Légion d'honneur. Yes. Just so you know no. that we're both wearing proudly our little yes, red Yes, this is Ruban, the only time so. where you will yes. see um, uh, two people with the Légion <laughs> on their lapels, or not the only time, but a time. Okay, we have the next question right here. My name is Mark, and first of all, thank you very much for coming out and sharing your experiences. My question, ironically enough, concerns the French language and mastering the French language. My personal experience, I studied in high school and in college. However, it wasn't until I joined the Peace Corps mm -hmm. and served as a volunteer in Chad, Africa. West Africa, right. Uh, Central Africa, actually, right. Chad. Um, and the bottom line is my question is, what was your experience with learning the French language 
Mine was the breakthrough occurred when I lived in Chad and, and had to speak French in order to obviously communicate with others. Um, I'd be curious as to whether or not you feel the immersion process to learn a language is critical. And thank you very much. Yeah, you know, I grew up in Montreal, Canada, which is a French-speaking city, obviously, and I learned hockey French. I learned all the vocabulary of ice hockey, which is the religion, the national religion of Quebec. And um, so that was not very helpful in France, the, the vo having a very advanced vocabulary for talking about ice hockey. Um, but you find, yes, exactly, uh, uh, immersion matters, and, the, and the, the two things that will produce excellence in language learning are eroticism and emergency, and the two can be linked. <laughs> the way to learn another language is to fall in love with someone who only speaks that language, like, you know, the Beatles' great song, Michelle, right? You know, he's, that's how you do it. And the way that my wife and I realized that we had finally, after six years in the country, we were not that bad in French was exactly when Olivia was being born and she got turned around, as happens to babies, and we had to make the decision, it was Martha's decision, but obviously I was there, on whether or not to wait to see if the baby would flip again or to do an emergency cesarean. And after much back and forth, they decided, she decided, that well, let's do the emergency cesarean, find baby, everything was great. And it was only a couple of days later that we looked at each other and said, we did that whole thing in French, right? <laughs> You know, qu'est-ce que vous conseillez, madame? Est-ce que c'est une bonne idée de, de le faire ou pas? And we just did the whole thing in French without even stopping to think that we were speaking French. We, we just did it. And that's still the height of my of language. So and Hopefully a conversation you don't have to have again. Yes, that we never <laughs> will have again. But it was the proof. So emer create an emergency or find an erotic relationship. <laughs> All right, your next question is right over here. And unfortunately, this will be our last question oh, of the evening. Too bad. I'll try to make it a good one. I'm Gina Bucola. I'm chair of humanities at Roosevelt University oh, here great. in Chicago. And I just thought while we're here with Chicago Humanities in this Church of the Humanities, if you could speak a little bit to the way in which at least I feel the humanities are sort of under siege right now with backlash against higher education yep. and book bans nationwide, et cetera. I would love to, and, and it's a pleasure to meet you. I, I had once did a lecture at Roosevelt on Galileo and Shakespeare. And it was one of my, I worked hard on it, and it was something, um, I do even better lectures for Gloria. But, I, but it was a good lecture. Thank you. It was a good lecture, and I love doing it, and I love the environment. Yes, let me speak to this, because I feel passionately about it. One of the points of the book, which I actually wrote about overtly in the first draft of the introduction, and then was persuaded by my editor to delete, because it seemed too, um, uh, what's the word, too inside baseball, in a way was that one of the things that this book is about is the superiority of the humanities to the social sciences. Um, because you will find, <laughs> you will find a lot of people, you know, a lot of this book is about material that very much is the domain of the social sciences, right? How do we learn things? How do we know things? What's the, what are the, uh, what goes on in our heads? What goes on in our lives? What's the social psychology of learning? All those things. And that's all valuable and, and useful and so on. But the point is, is that in real human lives, there are so many vectors pressing down on everything we do. And that's what, I was trying to, that's what I'm trying to say in this book. You can't extract out the, the cognitive psychology of learning from the social psychology of family relations. And you can't uh, uh, extract out the social psychology of family relations from the intimate psychology of, uh, of sibling relationships. And you, there will never be a science of family. There will never be a science of siblings. There will never be a science of storytelling. There will never be a science of love. Not because these things are ineffable or mystical, but exactly because they are so deeply human, which means simply so susceptible to so many vectors at the same time, that the only way we can explain them and talk about them adequately is through the humanities, is through essays and stories and novels and songs. That's the material by which we come to understand um, the, the most difficult things we do in life. So this book is meant to be a vindication of the superiority of the humanities to explain the things that matter most to us in life over all, um, anything you can study in a STEM program. Is that a place to end? That's a beautiful <laughs> place to end. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Round of applause.